Hello, welcome everyone. Good morning to the United States and good afternoon to Europe. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar to discuss European reactions to the US election, preparing for a second Trump term. Uh, my name is Alexandra de hoop -Scheffer. I'm the acting president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and I am absolutely delighted to host this important exchange today. Um, the election of Donald Trump will obviously have important implications for Europe and the transatlantic relationship for the four years to come. And we are facing a unique opportunity to co-shape Americans and Europeans the transatlantic agenda for the four years to come because we have simultaneously the upcoming American administration and a new European Commission. And the German Marshall Fund as a transatlantic organization is actively contributing to this transatlantic agenda. Um, I'm very happy to introduce my colleagues here because um, as you know, GMF has a unique office network across Europe and of course our headquarters in Washington. But this geographical footprint really allows us to be able to understand the national perspectives, the regional perspectives, and of course have a pan-European perspective on all issues facing Europe and the transatlantic relationship. So I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, some of my colleagues here, GMF's top experts based in our different office locations, uh, Suda, uh, David Wolp in Berlin, Michal Baranowski in Warsaw, Martin Conseil in Paris, Georgina Wright in London, Osgur Unelu Sertale in Ankara, sorry, and uh, Ian Lesser uh, in uh, Brussels. Uh, so my colleagues will be discussing um, their respective national policy priorities for the transatlantic relationship uh, in the four years uh, to come, how the US election, how the re-election of Trump is perceived from their own uh, locations. Uh, and then I really want want to take a more forward-looking approach to the conversation. How does uh, the Trump re-election alters, adjust their approaches to NATO, uh, to the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, uh, and uh, China? Um, I'm happy to leave the floor to my colleague uh, Gesine uh, Weber, based in Paris, who will take over the moderation. Gesine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I'm very much delighted to be here among all these uh, colleagues for these very different um, European perspectives. Before we kick it off, um, a few housekeeping remarks. So um, I invite all the participants here to join us for a Q&A. And you can find the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen. And um, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available later on GMS YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's jump into that and in the perspectives from the capitals. With that, I hand it over to Suda David Wilk, who is GMS Regional Director for Germany and based in the Berlin office. Suda, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Gazine, and thank you, Alexandra. It's great to be with my colleagues zooming in from Berlin, battling a little bit of a cold, um, tis the season, but um, I do want to uh, share my thoughts with all of you on the reaction in Berlin. To be honest, the reaction in Berlin was actually muted. It was expected to be a close election, and um, in all honesty, domestic political machinations here about a teetering traffic light coalition really kept uh, people internally focused. Berlin was very internally focused. Um, in the week leading up to the US election, it was expected that the um, coalition was uh, going to crack. The question was how long would it crack? It ended up uh, falling apart the night after it was known that uh, President Trump would return to the White House. Uh, Germans woke up on November 6th hearing about Pennsylvania and went to bed um, watching TV with Schultz dismissing his finance minister and basically ushering in um, uh, or setting the stage for snap elections here in Germany. 
So I think the return of President Trump to the White House for Berlin is about damage control. Uh, will there be a return to public shaming on topics that, uh, mind you, had some you know, merit um, that President Trump criticized, for example, uh, the construction of Nord Stream 2 and defense spending on the part of Germany. But I think, um, you know, also Germany is also looking very closely about whether President Trump will enact across the board tariffs, uh, which he's announced that he would do when it comes to Mexico and Canada on day one and China. And tariffs here for Germany and Europe will undoubtedly have a very adverse effect on an already soft German economy. So, you know, looking back in 2016, when um, President Trump won, I think President Trump had a right to sort of disparage Germany on a number of issues, uh, maybe not publicly as, as he did or in his style, but, you know, there was anemic defense spending here in Germany. There was a dependency on Russian gas and also, um, you know, very much open trade with China. But however, in the last two years, Germany has altered its stance on all these issues uh, and is also aware that the 2% uh, NATO commitment is not going to be sufficient moving forward. So, you know, when President Trump uh, returns to the White House, he'll be also facing a different leader. It's not going to be Chancellor Merkel, and that will also perhaps offer an opportunity for a new uh, page in the bilateral relationship. Uh, it will either, it will be Chancellor Schultz still in office, but uh, a new government could also produce a different chancellor after the election on February 23rd. So I think there's also a chance in changing the dynamic that was there um, when President Trump was first in office. And apparently the phone call between Chancellor Schultz and President Trump, which received a lot of criticism among partners of Germany, uh, was matter of fact, President Trump had a lot of questions for Chancellor Schultz. And I guess he understands that Germany needs to be in the mix when it comes to the question of Ukraine and European security architecture. So I think um, to wrap up, Jazine, most policymakers are aware that the transatlantic relationship is not going to be the same. And it's essential that um, building up a European pillar of defense is necessary. But, um, you know, at the same time, an election first has to take place here in Germany. I'll stop there. Thank you so much for uh, these insights, Suda. Um, we will immediately move east to uh, Warsaw and uh, Mikhail Baranowski, who is Managing Director of uh, GMF East and will give us the perspective from Poland. Thank you very much, Jazine, and it's great to be with colleagues. It's great to be with uh, friends watching online, you know who you are. Uh, and I look very much to, the, to, to our conversation. Uh, the perspective in Warsaw on the surface is very different than, than in Berlin. Uh, Yet there are some underlying concerns that I would share with with Suda. But let me let me start on a on a sort of surface picture. Uh, on a surface picture, uh, first of all, there is clear recognition that Poland uh, and Europe will need to work with President Trump, as we would work with anyone else who is selected and elected by American people to be president of the United States. Uh, there is also a, a very well-based expectation that the bilateral relations will be uh, fine. A uh, few reasons for this. Um, we know that President Trump uh, cares about burden sharing uh, and Poland is spending, will be spending next year 4.7% of GDP on defense. This year we are spending 4.2%. This is actually higher even than the United States. And among this really large pile of, of cash, 50 billion has gone to the United States for Poland's modernization. So we are a good ally, both when it comes to caring for our own security and, and working with US businesses. US is also investing in Polish nuclear power. Uh, already the first project has been awarded to Americans. The second one, uh, the government is still, uh, is still this, uh, deciding. And third reason for it is that the in the first Trump uh, term, Poland and US has had very good relations. So there is a, you know, there is this affinity from president-elect toward, toward Poland. Again, the bilateral piece uh, is expected to, 
uh, thrive perhaps even uh, even better than it was was there before. Where there are concerns uh, and they are very real is about the broader impact that we would have on few in few areas. The predominant one is the stance of a president elect when it comes to security of Ukraine and the potential negotiation with Russia over um, ceasefire or perhaps a longer term deal. The, the concern in, in, in Warsaw is of course about uh, this conversation happening either without Ukrainians or certainly uh, without Europeans and uh, for the ceasefire to be a bad deal that eventually would mean worsening of the security situation for Poland and Europe more broadly uh, if Putin is given uh, an impression that he succeeded in, in Ukraine. So that's that's point number one uh, in, when it comes to concerns. The second concern is a version of what, what Suda talked about and, uh, and that's trade. Even though, even though Poland and US don't have a huge trade uh, balances and, and we have a positive uh, trade balance with, with the US, something that is very important for President Trump, EU has of course a trade surplus with the United States and any sanction, any tariffs vis-a-vis -vis EU, vis-a-vis uh, -vis our trading partners, big trading partners, for example, like uh, Germany would impact Polish economy very, very quickly. And this, by the way, if this happens, that this ha would happen during Polish EU presidency, where Poland chairs meetings of the European Council and works closely with Commission and others also on trade, on trade issues. And thirdly, is the extent of US when it comes to European security more broadly. And here, and I will close with this, the Poland, the conversation in Warsaw are very much about being having a proactive stand of Europeans, not necessarily vis-a-vis -vis a president elect, but to make sure that we have, um, that we understand collectively as Europeans that we need to step up when it comes to taking care of our own security. We need to step up when it comes to support for Ukraine. And the question is, who are the Europeans who can do that? And the best example of this attempt of early conversation, because it's unfortunately early, has been a meeting in a Weimar Plus format. So that's Poland, France, and Germany, along with uh, Italy and UK, uh, with Spain and, uh, and Kaya Kalas, the high representative, joining remotely. So basically a forming a group of biggest countries that to provide leadership um, for Europe to step up. A leadership, frankly, I think now coming more from, from Warsaw and from Paris uh, than perhaps from Berlin for the reasons of very difficult internal political situations that Suda um, put forward. The proof is in the pudding, though, whether we Europeans can deliver on this, but that's very much the more than hope, but the strategy for uh, for for Warsaw to um, to put forward ideas in the early months of Trump administration. Let me pause here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michal. And with your point, leadership coming from Warsaw and Paris, you're basically giving me the perfect transition to hand it over to Martin Cancé, who is managing director of GMF Risk and Strategy and director of the Paris office to give us a few insights on the, period, on the French perspective. Martin, over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jezine. I'm very happy to join the group for, for the discussion. So I think the French reaction was, was well summarized by the two communication, two tweets by President Macron on November 6. He was one of the very first international leaders to congratulate Donald Trump for his victory. He reminded Donald Trump that he already worked with him for almost four years during the first mandate, and he wants to put himself almost as the direct in interlocutor to, to the new administration, knowing that in Europe right now, he's one of the very few uh, leaders who has this, this personal experience of working with Donald Trump uh, in the White House. 
The second communication almost directly after this congratulation was directed to Berlin and to other European leaders saying, well, we need to get to work. So I think the main message coming from Paris was that we will work with the Trump administration. We want to cooperate on a number of issues because that's actually in our interest to find compromises, to find points where interests converge with the United States. But the first sort of move is to find a European answer to the many questions that this elections ask to European uh, countries. Now, he turned first to Chancellor Schultz, as this is traditional in, in the French sort of diplomatic system to think in the Franco-German framework. But the situation in Germany forced France to shift very quickly into different formats. And I think Michal was right to underline the, the significance of the Weimar format in this context. But even beyond Weimar, I think there will be in France uh, an appetite to work on ad hoc uh, formats that do not necessarily include Germany. And, and when you um, discuss especially the, the number one issue right now, uh, which is the future of Ukraine, the sort of coalition of the willing uh, idea has some support in Paris. And the coalition of the willing is something that could include Germany, perhaps, but more, more probably would focus on Poland, maybe the UK, Sweden, maybe a couple of Baltic and Nordic countries in addition. This is quite new in the traditional sense of, of the French reaction to, to, to such issues. But as we know with Emmanuel Macron, there is a strong uh, emphasis on the need to be pragmatic. And, and I think this will be what we will see from France between now and January 20th. Now, as I said, Ukraine is at the top of the priority list for Paris. Uh, I think discussions about European military presence in Ukraine are uh, the ones that are uh, most interesting to think about how France wants to react to the possibility of not being part of the negotiations that are to come. I think this is very much the, the nightmare scenario when a deal would be struck without any sort of European input. This is what France wants to avoid. And creating a, a sort of fait accompli with, with military presence or a, an important increase of European aid to Ukraine could, in the French mind, help avoid that scenario. The second issue uh, after Ukraine is one of trade with the threat of, of uh, blanket tariffs on, on Europe. This is something that is viewed obviously with great concern in Paris, not only because it would uh, affect uh, our economy, but because it would force Europe probably to make some compromises on some very difficult dossier. Uh, if we imagine that the Trump administration uses tariffs as leverage to get Europe to align with the US on other issues like China policy, this is something that France would be very uncomfortable with. So having a European response ready before uh, Donald Trump enters the White House on, on the, the threat of tariff is, is the second priority. And I would end with the third issue, which um, really matters to, to Paris as well, is the future of the US policy towards the Near and Middle East. And the, the first signals that we've seen in terms of the nomination for the US ambassador to Israel, or what Donald Trump and people around him have said about the future of the conflict. Um, this, these are signals that are seen with, with concern in Paris, because Paris is very much attached to the two-state solution in between Israel and Palestine. And also because Paris has this ambition of being part of any sort of future deal for peace in the region, notably including Lebanon. We'll see today if the ceasefire is indeed struck. But this thing will be central in the Franco-US relationship because Paris would not want the, the Trump administration to completely exclude France from future negotiation or political discussions about the Middle East. So Ukraine tariffs and Middle East very much uh, in, in mind right now in France. Um, but the first instinctive reaction was that the Macron and his government will be ready to work with the Trump administration. I'll stop here. Thank you, Marta. Uh, three huge issues, I think, all would potentially merit an entire hour of discussion. So thanks for putting them together so concisely. 
um, we're now jumping um, at least literally um, over the uh, channel over to London and Georgina Wright, who's a visiting fellow at um, GMF, as I said, based in London, and currently Deputy Director for International Studies and Director of the Europe Program at Institut Montaigne. Um, Georgina brings the British perspective um, to this webinar, and I'm delighted to hand it over to you, Georgina. Uh, thank you very much, Irina, and thank you for the invitation. I mean, a lot of um, sort of the UK's concerns have been kind of echoed by, you know, Suda, Martin, Michal. Um, I mean, it's important to remember there was an it was an important election year in the UK as well. Um, and the last time the US and the UK held uh, elections the same year was back in 1992. Um, I think that the impression in London is no one was particularly surprised by Trump's victory, even though I think some in the Labour Party would have preferred it to be Harris uh, because of their proximity into the ideological uh, uh, approaches. I mean, I think the government's perspective is we will work with whomever is in the White House. So we have a special relationship. We have common interests. We have common challenges. We have really close ties across uh, the political policy, defence, uh, intelligence communities. We have weathered Trump one and we're going to do so again with Trump two. Um, I think there's going to be sort of twin kind of two pronged approach. One is to invest massively in the bilateral relationship, but also trying to anchor the United States in existing alliances. Um, so AUKUS, for example, the Five Eyes Intelligence Group, um, even though Trump has been quite dismissive, of alliances, there's going to be a real attempt by the UK to, to keep the, U the US on board. Um, I think when it comes to Trump too, and in particular, the sort of how you could weaken the transatlantic relationship, there are sort of four major uh, concerns in London. The first is Ukraine. I think in London, they're quite lucid uh, about the fact that actually the fate of Ukraine could be determined with no Europeans in the room. Um, and if there is going to be a negotiated settlement, um, it's of utmost important to ensure that Moscow does not come out of it looking like it's been victorious. And so actually, given Ukraine's position right now, it's better to try and continue to support Ukraine so that it's in a stronger position to negotiate. And so I, I would expect the UK government to put a lot of pressure on the Trump administration to at least continue to support Ukraine until it is in a stronger position. I think, and it's been mentioned, the security guarantees is another key concern for London. So if Ukraine isn't to join NATO, then what do credible security guarantees look like? What do they look like if the US decides that she doesn't want to take part in those security guarantees? Um, how do we make sure that they prevent uh, you know, Russia from invading again? But also, how do we ensure that they're credible enough that Ukrainians will want to remain in Ukraine and rebuild their lives um, and not actually flee because they think that in a couple of years' time, uh, Russia will simply evade again? So I think the Ukraine is like Ukraine and what happens in Ukraine is a key concern. Then there's uh, European security. I think the view in London is we have to sort of try and keep the US uh, involved in some way in European security. Um, and we do that through two ways. One is by showing that we can do more as Europeans. And so you've seen the UK, um, you know, lots of meetings amongst like the UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Poland, uh, lots of kind of meetings since um, uh, the US election to try and sort of really think about what does it mean upping defence capabilities and a defence posture? Um, and I think there have been some encouraging signals from the EU, actually, in this respect, saying, you know, we we might be open to UK defence firms bidding uh, for EU defence funding. So there are shifts there happening. Um, then I think trade is another concern. I think the US sort of trade deficit thing is not as big of an issue uh, for the UK as it could be for uh, Germany. Um, and that the UK might be in a better position to weather uh, tariffs if, if those are imposed. Um, but, you know, tariffs could be a problem for kind of UK, US defence projects. So if you think in the context of AUKUS, it would make those much more difficult if defence firms that are partnering on the same projects have to actually pay more to export certain components to the US or, or vice versa. Um, but I think on the trade point, where I really see the problem is that it could become contentious in the UK EU rapprochement because I often get a sense that Labour think that because the, they're not the Conservatives, the EU will give be be nice to them and give them what they want. 
And in the same way, I feel that on the EU side, they think because Labour are not the Conservatives, they're automatically going to align with us, with the EU. Whereas, if anything, the UK is outside of the EU and will want to try and make use of that flexibility. So I think it would be wrong to assume that London will automatically align with Brussels, for example, in, in the case of tariffs being impo imposed on, on, on EU exports. So I think we need to be quite cautious um, about that. I don't really believe a UK-US free trade agreement would happen, but you know who knows. Um, but I think Stephen Moore, who's been one of Trump's main advisors during the campaign, um, has you know said that if the UK is serious about a free trade agreement, it needs to pivot away from the European socialist uh, model. Um, but nonetheless, I think, uh, and I will end on that, perhaps with China, uh, I think the UK is very aware that, uh, that Washington could pile on the pressure for the UK to align much more on the US's China policy, particularly around export controls. And so I think on all the things that we've um, established on defence in Ukraine, I'm fairly confident that the UK and the EU will be much closer together on trade in China and other issues. I could see points of contention, but perhaps we can come back to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgina. Absolutely uh, fascinating. And I think a lot of Good for thought. Um, I'm handing it over now to um, Ian Lesser, who is Distinguished Fellow and Advisor to the President based in our Brussels office. Um, Ian, you share some um, of your ideas on um, the EU and NATO and perceptions and priority in the okay. European and NATO capital. Okay, thank you very much, Asin. And you know, in I think we're having a little tech glitch here. Um, do you still hear us, Ian? Okay, then we will give Ian some time to um, come back here and um, improve um, the tech settings. Um, in the meantime, I'll hand it over to um, my colleague Özgür, who is a GMF's regional um, director for Turkey and um, who can share some of his insights on the Turkish perception uh, and priority after the elections. Thank you, Jezine. Uh, so the, the mood in Ankara was distinctly different uh, from the moods uh, in other European capitals. Uh, I can say that Ankara is cautiously optimistic uh, about the uh, second Trump presidency. The optimism uh, stems from the personal relationship uh, between Erdogan and Trump. Uh, during Trump's first presidency, the two leaders were never shy to express uh, their appreciation of each other uh, publicly. Uh, they also met nine times in person, uh, including one visit by President Erdogan uh, to the White House. They, they had countless uh, bilateral telephone conversations where, where they solved certain problems just uh, with one telephone call uh, between two leaders. Uh, and there is no reason uh, to think that, uh, that their uh, relationship will be any different this time. But then why the cautiousness? Why not just pure optimism? Well, the, there are three reasons uh, for the cautiousness. Uh, first, uh, President Trump uh, may have a good relationship with President Erdogan, but he is also unpredictable. And his relationship with Erdogan did not prevent him from, for example, removing Turkey from the F-35 program, imposing cuts or sanctions on Turkey, and basically triggering a financial crisis in Turkey uh, by threatening on social media that he would do so. I don't know if he really intended to, it, to do it, uh, but uh, that was the result. Well, the second cause of concern uh, is Trump's foreign policy team. The already uh, announced uh, members of uh, Trump's policy, foreign policy team generally uh, have a clear negative attitudes uh, from Turkey, and they have taken uh, such positions uh, in the past. Uh, that's another uh, cause for concern for Turkey. Uh, third, and I think this may be even the most important uh, point, we should never forget about the Congress, uh, that President Trump, as a uh, President-elect Trump, uh, has a good relationship with President Erdogan, uh, doesn't mean that we can dismiss the uh, bipartisan uh, negative sentiment at the U.S. Congress uh, about Turkey. That's not automatically uh, going to go away. So on issues, uh, by the way, uh, President Erdogan was, I think, one of the uh, first three uh, American allies leader uh, to call uh, President Trump uh, together 
uh, with British Prime Minister Stormer and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, in this call, Erdogan uh, made a strong point about uh, bringing an end uh, to wars uh, in Ukraine uh, and the Middle East. And he also offered Turkey's mediation services in case uh, there are ceasefire uh, talks in Ukraine. Indeed, uh, as a matter of fact, Turkey may uh, be the only, well, maybe not the only, but uh, the most distinctive NATO ally in Europe uh, to support uh, President Trump in terms of uh, desiring a quick ceasefire uh, in Ukraine. And Turkey's pro-Kiev, but not overtly anti-Moscow position, uh, actually in this case, uh, may provide Turkey with the opportunity uh, to play a role in the process, uh, which is another, of course, uh, positive aspect uh, for Ankara. Now, when we come to other uh, policy issues, uh, actually, I cannot be so optimistic uh, because uh, given that Trump is likely to double down uh, on the support to Israel and Erdogan is not going to change his position, I do see an escal escalatory path there unless President Trump manages uh, to de-escalate uh, in the Middle East uh, very quickly. Otherwise, this could cause increasing tensions uh, between uh, Ankara and Washington, D.C. Uh, in the upcoming period. Now, regarding Turkey's priorities, there are actually two. Uh, the first two I already mentioned, uh, the escalation and ceasefire uh, in Ukraine uh, and the Middle East. The other two are particular to Turkey. Uh, so Turkey would like, if possible, uh, the U.S. administration to lift the Katsa sanctions uh, that were imposed in, on Turkey uh, for acquiring S-400 batteries uh, from Russia. I mean, there are already models uh, for solution uh, on the table, but they, they would also uh, necessitate the Congress's cooperation. Uh, so it's not up to Trump only, uh, but still Ankara is cautiously optimistic about that. The other is uh, Washington ending its relationship uh, with the YPG, uh, which Turkey sees as an extension of the PKK, which according to the United States uh, is also a terrorist organization. I just want to check how much more time I have. Uh, okay, so I think I should uh, wrap up uh, quickly now. Uh, on, the, on the trade issue, Turkey is actually a little bit uh, in a better position uh, than other uh, European countries in terms of trade because Turkey's trade with both the United States and China is very limited. But having said this, Turkey's most important trading partner uh, is the European Union. Uh, so any negative consequences for the EU are uh, bound to have also uh, negative consequences on Turkey. Uh, and maybe I should wrap up here uh, by saying that Turkey may be presented uh, the same lemons uh, with everyone else, uh, but it seems Turkey is going to try to make a lemonade at this initially. Thank you so much, Oskar. Loved the metaphor. Um, that is still a bit uh, optimistic as a as a conclusion, I think, and um, maybe a good scene setter for the rest of the conversation. Now I'll hand it over again to uh, Ian Lesser um, for the EU and NATO perspective, and also remind our participants that you are invited to um, pop questions into the Q and A function um, because we will have a few minutes for Q and A after Ian's remarks. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And my apologies again. I'm not sure what went wrong, but good to be back with you. Um, you know, in many ways, sitting in Brussels, especially for the EU, the concerns are really a, a sort of sum of all the things that we've heard already from uh, my colleagues, to be honest, um, but with some additional twists, I would say. Um, obviously, there are changes of leadership that are taking place uh, actually now in Brussels. So a new group is coming in here. Um, you know, what is it that that Brussels worries about? Well, I mean, let me just mention a couple of things. First, um, there is the, this inevitable comparison with the Biden administration experience, which was very distinctive. I mean, I think it's important to remember this, that the relationship between the Biden administration and the Biden White House in particular and Brussels was very close. And that wasn't the case even in the Obama administration necessarily. There was a particular interest in Washington in seeing the European Union as an institution as an interlocutor on many key issues, even where you didn't need to. Um, and that is going to change. Uh, it, it, people here are very aware that, um, that Trump's outlook on international policy 
uh, is not driven by institutions. Um, it is to some extent bilateral, even more perhaps about leaderships. And, um, you know, by many of these measures, uh, Brussels has reason to worry. So there, there is that. That is going to change. The EU just is not going to be as central, uh, it is assumed here, to the transatlantic relationship, precisely at a time when some of the key issues, uh, you know, are right in Europe's competence on trade in particular. So the, the second point I would make is, uh, and this is very Brussels, huh? that, uh, that the outcome of the election underscores these existing debates and anxieties in Europe that predate the election, predate the outcome. Um, uh, you know, just to mention two, obviously this question of economic competitiveness in all its various dimensions that the Draghi report underscores. Um, the outcome in Washington uh, just you know, just has given history a shove in a sense, uh, making it, you know, very clear that Europe is either, it faces a moment of decision in a sense about whether it's going to adjust institutionally, structurally to these things, some of the very long-term challenges or not. And whether Europe is going to engage with the United States on trade and other matters uh, somehow collectively as it is supposed to or, or not, whether it's going to resort to a, a set of bilateral relationships and engagements. And there will be some in Europe who are going to look to do that. Uh, we've heard a little bit of that already. Um, the other side of it, um, and it's very important, obviously, is the defense side. Um, the Again, this is a pre-existing concern, but it's now been given much greater urgency by the approach Trump has taken historically to burden sharing, uh, you know, and the potential for the United States to disengage from European security uh, in ways that Europe would find deeply uncomfortable. Not only that, you know, okay, Europe is already thinking about this, but is that going to be a fast adjustment or a slow one? Uh, and under a Trump administration, it could, combined with things happening in Asia, be a relatively uh, fast one. It's also, uh, it, it, we already see signs of a very explicit linkage, which is very unusual, between regulatory outcomes, for example, uh, and what we do, what the U.S. does, I'm an American sitting in for Europe in security terms. Yes, there were always these implicit trade-offs, but this transaction in the broadest sense now has become very explicit. Uh, uh, J.D. Vance talked about this uh, a week or two ago very explicitly. Uh, this is a big concern for Brussels. A number of different issues. Uh, third, where uh, you know there will be concerns and we're unlikely to be on the same page on Iran, on climate, on the ICC, on the Middle East, on China. Uh, there are very few things that Republicans and Democrats agree on these days. I, I would argue that a harder line on China is perhaps one of the very few. Uh, Europe is very aware of this. Brussels is very aware of it. Um, the blowback from this in trade terms would be intense in Europe in ways you've heard about a bit already, uh, but also including the dumping of Chinese goods potentially in Europe. Um, so on many fronts, uh, there is there is anxiety. Final word on NATO, perhaps, Jacine, if you if you wish. I mean, I, look, the U.S., I mean, here I'm inserting some of my own assumptions about U.S. behavior, uh, but I think it accords with what you hear here. Uh, yes, of course, there's deep concern given the tensions the last time around, um, but there is no, I don't think the consensus view is that the U.S. will somehow dis withdraw from NATO. That's not going to happen. Um, it's both politically and legally doubtful that Trump could do that if, even if he wanted to. And at the end of the day, it's in American interest. Will he insist that Europe pay more and do more? Absolutely. Will this be uncomfortable? Absolutely. Uh, but the extreme scenarios, I think, are most unlikely, and that's broadly the assumption here. So perhaps I can stop with that. Thank you so much, Ian, bringing it all together in the EU uh, and NATO perspective. Um, we already have a few questions in the chat, and um, I would like to take up one of these and turn to an issue that uh, Martin already mentioned in his remarks, which is um, the conflict in the Middle East. And um, the question is precisely linked to the uh, arrest warrant issued by the ICC. Um, Martin, how do you think that um, the war in the Middle East could impact uh, the US-European relationship? And um, is, does this ICC arrest warrant um, particularly play, play into this? Well, well on the ICC, um, the French position has been relatively interesting to follow because on the one hand, you'll hear the, the foreign ministers saying that France will always respect international law. On the other hand, 
No French official has effectively said, if Prime Minister Netanyahu comes to France, France will ar arrest him, right? Refusing to, um, to actually uh, commit to, to, that, to that action. So staying sort of vague, I think that this is true for France. This may be true for a number of other European countries. And this illustrates the major discomfort that the decision has put many European leaders into. Um, there is a hope in a sense that the situation will sort of fix itself with US pressure rather than having to address the, the clear difference of perspectives between the different uh, transatlantic allies on this. Um, I think it was also interesting that, as far as I know, one of the European leaders that was most vocal about the fact that Europe should, in fact, uh, uh, respect the decision of the ICC and meaning arrest Benjamin Netanyahu if he, if he comes to, to Europe, uh, was Joseph Borrell, who, as we know, won't be in his position in just a couple of weeks from now. So it, it's easier, obviously, when you are the outgoing uh, official to take that position. I think more generally, though, uh, the, 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 the question is whether um, there will be a major shift in the U.S. position with regards to uh, the annexation of the West Bank and of Gaza. And if the policy towards Israel on these matters uh, become completely different from what we've heard so far from previous U.S. administration, then Europe, in fact, becomes... Uh, the only one in the transatlantic relationship still favoring the two-state solution. Now, this could be a, a, um, an issue that becomes a wedge between the US and Europe because it affects also domestic politics and it becomes much more difficult for European leaders to uh, continue to work with uh, the White House at the same level. So we can envision something that, that sort of spill over other dossier of the transatlantic relationship if it touches the, the very specific question of the annexation of the West Bank and Gaza. Thank you so much, Marta. Um, maybe I'll also um, ask you, Özgür, whether you want to come in on that issue as Turkey is directly uh, in the neighborhood. How do you see the conflict uh, impact um, US-Turkey relations? and um, also Turkey's um, broader perspective on transatlantic relations. Uh, thank you, Jezine. I, As I briefly mentioned in my uh, initial remarks, uh, the Middle East uh, or the Middle East crisis is an issue that could cause serious, uh, crisis, a serious crisis between Turkey and the United States uh, because Turkey not only uh, is pro-Palestine, uh, but the Turkish government uh, also has publicly announced that it does not see Hamas uh, as a uh, terrorist organization, but sees it uh, as a resistance uh, organ, legitimate resistance organization. Uh, so there is no way that the Turkish and American positions uh, can be reconciled. Now, on, of course, the ICC war in Turkey is not a party uh, to the ICC, uh, so uh, is maybe uh, immune uh, from this uh, problem. Uh, but Turkey also has other concerns. It's not, ju it's not, it's not just uh, Gaza. I mean, if there's escalation between Israel and Iran, and if this escalation also pulls the United States into a conflict, Turkey would have other reasons for concern because uh, su such an escalation uh, in Turkey's neighborhood uh, would have significant negative consequences for Turkey in the form of lost trade, uh, economic constraints, uh, possibly a new wave of uh, refugees and a worsening security situation. Uh, so on those issues, uh, I think that Turkey and the United States uh, will unfortunately be uh, in a, uh, let's say, in a crisis mode in the upcoming period. Thank you, Oscar. Um, we have several questions in the chat um, relating to the question of European unity and whether Europeans will actually be able um, to come up with a common answer or maybe even a common offer to um, the Trump administration. And for that question, I would like to turn to Michal as um, the most important or most uh, short-term issue and that is most likely going to be um, an approach to the situation in Ukraine. How do you assess um, that, Michal? Is it going to be bilateralization or is there potential for a European approach? Well, there is certainly preference for European approach, I think, across Europe, uh, certainly in Warsaw, uh, despite 
perhaps good future bilateral relations and past future, past good bilateral relations with Trump. I think we uh, to be effective, we need to be uh, both united, but we need to have uh, some good ideas and some uh, uh, bravery when it comes to really putting putting uh, putting our heads together. And let me expand on this a, a little bit. It's, um, it's not about standing vis-a-vis -vis Trump or putting something on the table for him. Uh, and that's, you know, we, there is of course a range of debates here, uh, but I think in Warsaw and, 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 and in other capitals, but it's really what we Europeans can do for ourselves, for our European security, for our European security in Ukraine. Uh, can we fill a gap that can be there created by, by the US? Um, and in that way, um, the, the hypothesis is that by standing up with our own capabilities, with our own um, increased help to Ukraine, we'll be able to keep US more engaged than it would otherwise uh, be uh, tempted to, to disengage. I, I think we are in a moment, and this is, you know, I'm struck time and time again in, in these conversations of alignment between, between Poland and France. Um, and, 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 and it's not only because uh, Martin and, like, and, and, and I like each other, that the thinking is very, uh, really rings so true about the coalition of the willing countries, very much along the lines of Poland through the Baltic Sea, Scandinavia, uh, to France and perhaps Italy as well, and and waiting for Germany to figure out what what Germany wants to wants to do. But proof is in the pudding uh, whether we can uh, we can deliver. So far, um, I think we are frankly quite behind uh, the events. It's uh, even though it was clear that either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump wins. We have not been prepared as Europeans to really come up with European uh, answers to, to the questions that, that uh, Americans are, are, are telling us that we need to, that we need to answer. So um, I have hope, but, but there is not yet very clear proofs that Europe will be able to quickly uh, fill the space to be a real player uh, in a conversation over peace or ceasefire in Ukraine in a way that solves and, and, and addresses our European security uh, problems that could be created by a bad deal. Let me stop here. Thank you, Michal. I hand it over um, to Ian also on the question of European unity, maybe also on the other questions like, let's say, trade or the the fields where the European Union has a bit more competence and um, policy um, design ability. How do you assess that? Well, Justine, thank you. You know, the short answer is nobody knows. I mean, this this is all the debate, and and you hear this this repetition uh, very often uh, of this this sort of old line, sometimes true, about Europe being stronger out of crisis. Uh, well, you know, I, I, my sense is that there is a problem about patience in Washington with regard to this. I mean, many of the answers that uh, Europe will be seeking in response to the Trump administration's uh, policy shifts, uh, you know, would take a long time. And I don't, th you know, whether, you know, whether it's building a, a serious defense capability or, or it's really uh, doing the kinds of things that Draghi calls for in terms of economic competitiveness, these are real answers to the kind of challenges that the Trump uh, advent of a Trump administration presents. Those are very long-term projects. Uh, but I'm not so sure that there's going to be that kind of patience uh, in Washington when it comes to measures of burden sharing and many, many, many other things. Um, and I do think there are signs that um, President Trump even himself will look to individual personalities in Europe uh, and see them as valid interlocutors and, and not have patience with many others. Um, and we can, you know, make a short list of who those personalities might be, but, you know, we know pretty much who they are. 
Um, and, and I would expect quite a lot of that, actually, a kind of personalization, even beyond a bilateralization, a personalization of the relationship with Europe, for better or worse. Thank you, Ian. And with the um, basket of personalization, you're basically giving me the perfect transition to um, hand it over to Georgina for a question on um, one person that is also all asked in the chat in the chat here, and that is uh, the very role of uh, Italy's um, Giorgia Meloni, whether she could potentially be um, a bridge between Trump um, and the EU or also NATO Europe more generally. Uh, Georgina, what's your take on that? Um, it, it does feel, Ian's right, that there's a scramble at the moment in Europe to try and find the top interlocutor uh, on behalf of Europe, uh, the Trump administration. I mean, I think it will depend on the issue, quite frankly. Uh, but if we look at sort of Meloni, um, I mean, she has some advantages. The first is that uh, both Trump and Elon Musk have said how much they like her. I think Elon Musk even called her a lioness. Um, so she, you know, that helps to know that that you sort of uh, that you're liked already. Um, I think also um, they share at least, you know, that the Republican Party and Maloney's party share some sort of conservative like ideological values and particularly the conservative values, uh, which also makes it easier perhaps to have um, some of those conversations. But I also think that there are uh, key differences uh, between Trump and Maloney. First is a uh, position on Ukraine and in particular, uh, Trump's sort of fascination or so-called fascination with Putin. And Meloni has been very dismissive of Putin several times publicly. Um, and I think uh, that is that is a key point of contention. Also on tariffs, you know, if Trump decides to impose tariffs on EU exports, I mean, the US is Italy's second uh, largest market and it would really create an additional uh, shock at a time when Meloni is looking for good economic news. Um, so that would that would be pretty bad. Um, but I also think that internally, uh, Meloni is walking a very uh, fine or tight line or fine line. She she kind of has to be sufficiently close to Trump that she can show that she can influence the United States or has brought the United States and Europe to an understanding. But she has to be sort of far enough uh, to convince all those Italians who voted for her but don't necessarily like her kind of a far right, uh, you know, positions on social issues that she can be someone who is uh, centrist on certain things, you know, professional, credible. And so some of Trump's attacks, I think, uh, on the media, on the justice system, um, I think she will be cautious to not be sort of put necessarily in the same bag, even though she has sometimes herself criticised uh, some of those things. She won't want to be too closely associated to that because she wants to show uh, Italians or a majority of Italians that uh, she is more than a far right uh, candidate. So I think yes and no, essentially. Thank you so much. Um, and I would like to close um, the Q&A because before we head it over to one closing questions for all speakers, um, with one question that I would like to direct to Suda, which is, um, is there a risk that Europeans might be um, simply overwhelmed by the dramatic foreign policy changes that we might see um, in the US? And uh, maybe particularly for Germany, um, as the country is heading into elections, how do you see uh, Europeans and Germany's ability to deal with uh, the upcoming challenges? So maybe just one quick point, Jazine, if you'll allow me on European unity. Um, one thing that I think we tend to forget to is the German economy spillover effects within Europe. Uh, there are a lot of supply chain manufacturers in Hungary and Italy for Germany's car industry, and they may be quick to want to uh, make sure that there is unity when it comes to tariffs uh, from the United States, because uh, you know, Germany, uh, the United States is Germany's largest trading partner, and there will be an immediate effect if tariffs go up. On your question about European unity, you know, um, in the face of dramatic foreign policy changes, I think Germany is probably the laggard in Europe when it comes to realizing that the transatlantic relationship is not going to be the same as it once was. But it seems to me that the emotion is out. Uh, there's more practicality now here in Berlin after witnessing Trump in 2016. Nonetheless, we're on the eve of a German election. And, um, you know, there have been um, times in the past where the United States has loomed large, specifically the Iraq war when it comes to uh, election campaigning. And that could be the case again. We will see Trump certainly playing a role in uh, the German election, but also Putin. And the mainstream parties all realize that 
you know, um, uh, helping Ukraine, assisting Ukraine is absolutely essential with or without the United States to Ger Germany's national security um, and NATO security and European Union security. But um, there are two parties on the fringes, the BSW and the AFD, who will be certainly looking to um, have a um, anti-US uh, uh, tinge when it comes to political campaigning this year. Thank you so much, Suda. Um, with that, we're done with the Q&A, but I still have a question that I want to direct to all speakers. And as we are really running out of time, I ask you all to uh, limit your answer to 30 seconds. Um, if we look ahead and you imagine a scale from minus five, uh, which is a significant deterior deterioration, and plus five, which is a significant improvement, how does the country that you're sitting in or watching see the transatlantic relationship trending in the next four years and why? Let's just go in order of the first names. So start with uh, Georgina, then over to Ian, and we end with um, Suda. So just jump in in this order. Oh, I've got 30 seconds and it's really difficult. Um, I think I'm not going to answer the question. I think that London thinks that this is a new transatlantic, this is the beginning of a new form of transatlantic alliance and actually you can't use the same metrics. So I'm going to go for, for zero uh, at this point. Over to you, Ian. Minus three. Minus three. Don't ask me how I got to that, but <laughs> minus three. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over to Marta. Um, well, it's a tough one. I think that, in general, Paris tends to expect some sort of continuity. You know, the Paris debate on, on the US has been that in fact, there is more continuity than disruption between Obama, Trump, Biden, and now Trump again. So probably a minus one. Thanks, Michal. Yeah. So my joking answer is from plus five to minus five, uh, a range. I, I, I think more seriously, it is. It's certainly a range. I think on the maximum is is plus two, uh, assuming that Trump administration actually forces, motivates Europeans to, to do what we have been talking about doing for a very long time, and but this time being serious about this. But it ranges to very deep negative numbers if the most negative scenarios do happen. Uh, so government and people are preparing for this middle range, but a little bit uh, worrying about the most negative, negative scenarios. Thanks. Thank you. Let's go. I would say minus one uh, because Ankara sees the already existing negative trajectory uh, being mitigated a little bit, uh, but it will continue. Thank you so much. And Suda, last word goes to you. So minus, um, it definitely will go down after the heyday of the Schultz-Biden relationship. But we've seen these dips before. There's always been an Obama bounce and a Biden bounce um, afterward as well. So I think there are have always been high points and low points in the German-American relationship. Okay, so um, on this, I would say still cautiously optimistic note with high points and low points. Uh, let me close this webinar. Thank you to all um, the speakers here on the call with perspectives from Warsaw, Paris, Berlin, Ankara, London, and Brussels. And we hope to welcome you very soon again for another webinar on GMF. Have a good day. Bye.